Welcome to the Practice Podcast, conversations probing the nature of practice. I'm your host, Dave Fearon, co-author with Peter Vale of the digital book on practice as a way of being. Find it at mylibrary.world. And now to our show. The Dantru program and organization change and development at Bowling Green State University is an executive format and people study in cohorts. In the very first cohort of this really young doctoral program was uh, Kelly Clark, who was the person with whom we're having this conversation. And just a few days before this conversation, she re- she was uh, hooded. <laughs> she received the hood for her doctorate, and uh, and I was very pleased for her, of course. And so I wanted to get an idea of what brought her to the program, what kept her in the program, working and attending the program, and then what did she look forward to in the future. And probably there's two words that are the focus of her dissertation, exemplary leadership. That's what we'll be talking about. And I think she's going to become exemplary thought leader, an exemplary thought leader. This is Kelly Clark. Well, folks, uh, if you have been following our series of podcasts over the months, you probably figured out that I have particular fondness for the Bowling Green State University, even though mine is here in Connecticut, because I like the people, a lot of things about the Bowling Green and the people there, but I particularly like their, their still quite young doctoral program and organization uh, change and development. And uh, so I became acquainted with that program and then found out that they could publish the book that Peter and Vale, Peter Vale and I wrote called On Practice as a Way of Being. A little plug there, Kelly. Uh, but also it was the program itself was just getting off the ground around the time that I connected about getting the book done. And, and then I made another friend, Carol Gorlick, who you probably heard me talk about, who uh, w- has been a, a real friend of that program for a lot of years, but really have concentrated a lot on the, on this group that is just graduating now and just getting their hoods. And so I had to track down Ke- Kelly Clark because she was hooded at the same time as Doug Bella, who was an earlier episode in my podcast. So I Kelly, you know, uh, as more people get their hoods, I may be chasing them too, but I'm so happy for you because I know what an unusually uh, challenging and stimulating program that was. And now you are Dr. Kelly Clark. You are working with nonprofits and particularly helping develop exemplary leaders. And that's a fascinating challenge. So welcome. Thank you, Dave. It's great to be here. Is Bowling Green behind you and never going to go back, never talk to anyone there again? Is that how it is? No, no, not at all. I think one (laughs) of the um, things that I like most about the doctoral program at Bowling Green is um, the community that you're able to be a part of. That was one of the reasons why I chose that doctoral program. Uh, I was interested in the cohort approach. which there are other cohort approaches around for executive doctorates. Um, But I just, I was, I was excited about that. I was also really excited about um, the, uh, the way in which the program was structured. It includes an opportunity to spend time in three different countries uh, as a capstone course at the end of the coursework to learn from uh, folks in different parts of the world about how they're looking at organization development and change. And, you know, of course, it gives you an opportunity to pursue your own research um, through the dissertation, which of course isn't unique to that program, 
but uh, there were a lot of things that were unique. Like I said, the international course and the Bowling Green is a beautiful university and just amazing faculty that I've gotten to become friends with um, and amazing friendships with my colleagues. So I'm very much looking forward to, to staying connected to that community and the university. That's one of the huge payoffs. If you've had a very positive doctoral experience as several of my friends and I have had and staying with it now, Peter and I stayed connected for 50 years. I expect that hopefully you've got a young enough faculty that you can stay together with them for as many years, yes. but it, it's, it's a, you know, it's a comeback thing. You, you, you'll see them professionally. You'll, you'll cross paths, you know, as inevitable now, but you'll also have this feeling of, uh, I wonder how, you know, Professor so-and-so is doing. I'm just going to reach out, send a quick note, and boom, you know, you're having a let's catch up conversation, and you'll find out where their research is going, and they'll find out what you're doing. So good for you. I'm glad that you had such a great experience there, and I know why. Now, uh, wh what I want to know, though, is because a lot of those people who went into that program still are, we're pretty far along in, in some line of practice in their lives, uh, some professional or even, uh, you know, vocational practice. And, uh, you know, it wasn't absolutely clear that why a doctor is needed because you're tending to stay in what we academics call the real world. You might want to come in and teach a course or two, but the traditional doctoral preparation was that you're going to become a professor or a researcher and that's it. Mm -hmm. These professional programs, and Peter Vale actually worked for Antioch in his last stage because he loved the idea mm -hmm. of leadership for active leader people right. who are already active leaders. So what were you doing before, during, uh, that now, because you've had this additional ampage, if you will, in your life, uh, just uh, is still very fulfilling? Yeah. Um, so... I have uh, I have been in primarily I've been in the social impact sector throughout my career and I um, I became a leader at a relatively young age uh, working for the city of Chicago in a senior leadership capacity uh, earlier in my career and stayed in leadership for um, quite a while and one of the things there were a few things I think that drove me to be interested in the doctoral program related to that. Um, one was I didn't receive leadership training until probably 10 years into um, my service as a leader. So I became a leader, you know, early 30s. And I think I started receiving leadership training in my early 40s when I had some board members of a nonprofit I was leading that were in the private sector um, uh, in senior leadership in international companies. And this was something that was sort of recognized as something that yeah, was a, good it was a matter of course for those for the people yeah. who want money to pay for it. They were like, so of course I, you're I had, gonna of course you're gonna have leadership development. But in the nonprofit world, it's like, oh no, we'd love to, but <laughs> yeah. So I had great support from them and, and did some exec ed at the Harvard Kennedy School and then um mm -hmm. did a program at um the Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan over the course of several years, a, a leadership development program there. And I learned so much about leadership that I, I didn't know. And I did, um, I continued with a lot of the ways in which I showed up as a leader, but I also changed a lot of the ways I showed up as a leader. Um, I became a lot more, um, I, I began to give a lot more attention towards uh, making sure that I was understanding the needs of the staff and that they were having their needs met as well as our constituents and our clients, and that we were giving equal energy to that as we were to our mission. So I began to change how I was showing up as a leader, and that was really um, helpful, and I saw a lot of um, uh, uh, impacts from that, both in terms of the staff, but also it, it helped us be uh, better as an organization. And then the other thing I think that, um, so that was, that caused me to be curious about leadership, and that's been my primarily my primary research interest uh, in the doctoral program. The other thing I was curious about was I had led in um, environments that were defined by disruption and adversity. So I'd moved from Chicago, where I was serving in senior leadership at the city of Chicago, and then consulting. I'd moved back to Michigan in 2010, in the middle of or at the height, really, of the Great Recession. And 2008, 2009. Yeah. When they were so that, uh, repossessing houses one yep. after one after another. 
Yeah. And at that time, Michigan was leading the country in unemployment. It was also yeah. leading the country in population loss and in property abandonment. So I, I came back home to lead um, what was called a land bank authority in the local community I grew up in. And then I got involved in leadership at a statewide level, at the national level, while still leading the local group. And it was interesting to me because it was such a challenging time. You know, we were dealing with um, abandoned paper mills, uh, abandoned other commercial structures, um, blocks of housing um, that were not necessarily going to have a market in the in in the you know a time frame that we could foresee. At that time, um, in the commercial industrial buildings, we're not going to have a market that was aligned with their past use. So those were really hard times. And, and it was really amazing to me because we brought the community together. And I had, you know, an OD background before from some of the work I was doing when I was at the city of Chicago and consulting. So one of the things I did was bring the community together to build visions and strategies and, you know, make space for processing what was happening and all the different emotions, wow. Uh, wow. including grief and frustration, but also, you know, thinking about opportunities yeah. uh, with regards to how we might repurpose properties. And I was just so amazed at what the community was able to accomplish with regards to rethinking some of these spaces and then raising money and then transforming um, formerly, you know, a former paper mill was transformed into uh, a mixed use development. Uh, a uh, greenhouse. Paper mills are vast, by the way. I being from Maine, I I know you're talking about a lot of space. Yeah, and and it's not like you pluck a paper machine out, put people in. It's a ma a major undertaking. Yeah, but if you could use that as a shell to, to put life back into it of another kind, that's terrific. That's yeah. So I was curious about, you know, what is it that that causes um, communities to be able to come together or people or teams to be able to come together, even when the environments are really disrupted and uncertain? Mm. Um, and and what is enabling? So um, I, I pursued that in my doctoral studies, researching, learning about post-traumatic stress disorder, learning about growth mindset. Um, reading Bennis and Thomas's work, Crucibles and Leadership. Yeah, and, um, one of my favorite books. Yeah, that's an excellent book. Uh, ultimately doing my dissertation on uh, exemplary leaders during COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to put a big red circle around, a golden circle around exemplary leaders, because mm -hmm. that was the stress of your of your paper. and uh, And I can't imagine anyone trying to lead in those circumstances who hasn't found a whole lot about, more about themselves that make them the mm -hmm. sort of people you would call exemplary. So that, that's that's a really important point. So of all the ways that you could define leadership, why did you choose exemplary as the uh, identifier? Yeah, that's a good question. That's interesting. I did not give a... Um... A definition of what exemplary meant uh, when I was recruiting uh, participants for the study. What I did was I um, actually uh, asked followers to make nominations of who Stop. they felt was exemplary during COVID-19. And I was curious because research um, suggests that uh, leaders have a really large impact on the experience of followers. Uh, it, they can either, you know, exasperate situations or they can make things better. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we know that followers make up the largest um, population of people who are getting the work done in their organizations. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, they're human beings that go home to their families every night. So, I was curious from their perspective uh, who they felt was exemplary because I was interested in, in learning about those exemplary leaders that were deemed to be exemplary from their followers. So I didn't give, you know, I gave some suggestions. I, I said, you know, they might have exhibited behaviors like courage or empathy or compassion, um, but I really left it up, up to them. Yeah. To, to they, within that, they've got to come up with a name. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. and that, that's and it's got to rise up through 
and oh, oh now I get yeah, and oh by the way here's so uh, right and you had what 19 subjects did you say 17 17 yeah so um uh, across a local area or across a larger you spectrum? know they ended up being so I recruited through LinkedIn and I also recruited through BGSU mm -hmm. uh through the executive education um, programs there uh, so they ended up being really, um, in a, a lot of different places throughout the country. I had folks from the East Coast, folks from the Midwest, and some folks from the South. Yeah. Uh, so They're all in areas good. that have, had been particularly affected by the pandemic. It, was that one of your search requirements? Well, for, or did you just yeah. assume that it's pretty much everywhere? Yeah, that's it. That's exactly <laughs> it. Davis. There's no, was, no question. <laughs> yeah, that was one of the reasons why, you know, in, when I had this idea, and I remember talking to my dissertation chair, Deborah O'Neill, about the idea of COVID, um, she really liked the idea of that being the container Yeah. Uh, with regards to exploring um what was going on with these leaders that would cause them to be exemplary as as determined by their followers in disruption or adversity because we were all experiencing that throughout the world really right right and it yeah. was fascinating because i interviewed people in manufacturing i interviewed hospital leaders i interviewed people in financial services in consulting in sales uh nonprofit higher education and across the board um the commonalities with regards to what people were experiencing were so strong. Um, yeah. And the commonalities with regards to what these leaders were doing and how they were showing up, they the theme started emerging really quickly. It, um, at my third or fourth interview, that I've had themes. Well, for an they, investigator, that's damn exciting. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. you know, because you set yourself out, you know, pretty much say, okay, this has got to work. And so, if you're starting early on, starting to hear these themes coming up through, mm -hmm. through this, how structured were your interviews? Um, you? They were pretty unstructured. Uh, this particular topic is there isn't a huge body of work that really narrows right. in on so this you question. Could, you could kind of let the real person yeah. emerge in in yeah. those in those conversations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I, I, we could go through the entire volume of your work, but I'm uh, give me a sample, if you will, of what started to emerge early and stuck mm -hmm. all through the seventeen. Yeah, about their leading how yeah. they perceived it, how they showed up as leaders. Yeah. You know, I think, um, so there were, I would say, there were a lot of findings, but I think you know, two principal findings, um, both of which surprised me a little bit. And they didn't surprise me because they don't make sense. They make absolute sense. Um, they surprised me because I hadn't thought of it. Uh -huh. um, and so the first one was that across these 17 leaders, what I found was these leaders were really exemplary individuals, um, which that didn't surprise me. I was expecting that because I was looking for followers to make these nominations. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but what I hadn't thought about was it wasn't just about them. They existed within exemplary systems. So by and large, um, there was a theme where these leaders, for the most part, had strong leaders above them and strong leaders by their side that were also demonstrating the same kind of behaviors and had the same sort of value system, which I'll talk about in a minute as the second finding. Um, and where that didn't exist as strongly, uh, I think those leaders experienced the most internal stress themselves as individuals Yeah, because they were having to, you know, put more energy into yeah showing up in a particular way um uh but for the most part folks were very much supported so for me that that was something i hadn't thought about was how important it is for the system to be exemplary starting at the very top um yeah. so that people within an organization have the support they need and the the ways in which uh the ways in which leadership is happening has some consistency across the organization. Very important. And the, the larger caveat there is particularly when all the things that people 
we're used to doing, got hocked in a car cat, as we'd say in Maine, by the by the shutdowns and, and everything that followed. So, you know, you can kind of make it as you go along if you're in a rather rough ebb system when things are relatively stable. But boy, once that destabilization hit, that really brought the best and the worst out in people, didn't right. it? Right. And, uh, and so I can already imagine how fortunate those people were that they were in a healthy system to start with and had the mm -hmm. support up, down, and throughout. Uh, or they wouldn't have shown up at all in your study. Yep. So it yep. was, you got to thank that, that human system and the arrangements that have developed, you know, for providing right. you those wonderful subjects. But mm -hmm. also, if you take it out to the world, as I know you are as a consultant and a coach, for one of, I assume one of the first things you're going to look for is some sam some sampling of how well the system is working around, you know, the, right. the, the leadership system itself in the larger organization set setting. So, uh, yeah, uh, but you know the the pandemic's over. No, mm -hmm. but not really. It's actually reappearing in another form. You know, with more COVID. Right. But there's so while you had this study that talked about that time going forward, are you going to be looking for more situations that are highly disrupted as your place to be drawn to, to, to help and coach uh, or, mm -hmm. or how are you going to that? Because it's a wonderful thing to be able to find leadership in, in totally disrupted situation, wholly disrupted situations. Like you mentioned, the, the depression mm -hmm. of, of Michigan uh, during the, the recession. But um, when you get to what we think is a better future, right? Uh, you think, well, I guess there's not going to be as easy demand for me to be helping those leaders in those situations, mm -hmm. unless you go, you know, go far in a field to find them. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm stretching a point badly, but. Yeah, I guess, you know, like, where do you find work ahead? <laughs> so I think, um, you know, what I what I'm hearing from colleagues and peers across industries um, is that, you know, and this was the place this this was the case before COVID, but I'm I'm hearing and sensing that um, it's it's more magnified now after COVID that disruption in change is the name of the game. Uh, and that even though we, you know, may be sort of considering sell ourselves out of the COVID pandemic, um, yeah, our sort of organizational environments across industries are still defined by environments which are much more uncertain than they ever were in the past. Definitely. And that, you know, that's not just caused by COVID. That was a trend that was happening prior to COVID. Um, but I think what I'm sort of seeing with my colleagues across industries that the their remnants of COVID are still impacting us, right, in terms of supply chains and market demands and changing markets. And then, of course, we have AI on the scene now and, you know, constant change. And, and um, where do you put your workers these days since we once let them right. all be at home? <laughs> exactly. You know, you know the, yeah. The remote versus hybrid versus in-person conversation, all sorts of other conversations happening with generational change in the workforce with yep. regards to Gen Z and millennials. So I think, you know, to your question about where do you think you could be most helpful, I did this research because I was interested in, like I mentioned before, I had seen some pretty amazing things happen um, when humans came together, even in environments that were disrupted. Yep. Um, that allowed uh, for progress to be made, uh, allowed for people to, to have impact. And so I was curious, well, you know, is there a way to sort of study that and understand, um, you know, it's, it's, you might notice that's happening while it's going on, but you don't necessarily understand everything that's going on. And, and maybe, you know, you're influencing the process with whatever tools you have, but you might not even be so aware of how you're doing that, right? You're just, exactly. you're in the middle of it. Um, so the research, I think, um, the other finding, the principal finding that I want to lift up was that these leaders and their systems um, were, were defined by taking care of both people and business with equal energy. Uh, so, And that was a little bit surprising to me because I think I had 
thought that I might find that these leaders were really people focused and they were got to keep the business. They were people focused, but the thing I hadn't given as much consideration to, it's not that I didn't think it was important. I just frankly hadn't given as much consideration to was the importance of the business focus. And so these individuals, you know, they, they felt very responsible and accountable in their positions to make hard decisions even when there wasn't consensus, what they did was they communicated those decisions out and acknowledged if a decision had to be made in, you know, around say PPE, for example, or perhaps layoffs, acknowledged that that was a hard decision, gave people space to have all those emotions around that, took ownership of the decision. Um, But they made decisions, they had their eye on the ball, but at the same time they were, you know, also they had enough energy stores left and enough creativity and adaptability and um, to really be thinking about individual employees, teams, connecting with them, showing them compassion, making sure people had what they needed to be able to be okay, whether or not that was childcare or, um, you know, supports at home in terms of furniture um, and that sort of thing or equipment. So I think back to your question about where could this work be most helpful? I think this work, could be helpful anywhere given you know disruption is so frequent and uncertainty is sort of the way in which we we need to orient ourselves um but i think um because of the the finding around the system component being so important i think um where it could be most helpful is where there are companies or individuals or nonprofits or organizations where there are leaders who either have existing exemplary systems and they just want to keep that and enhance that, or perhaps they don't feel they have exemplary systems, but they have a curiosity and an openness and a desire to change. So I think that's where where there would be alignment for the work to be helpful is for where there are individuals who have a curiosity and a commitment and want things to either continue to be going well, or they want things to be going better. And they they have um, sort of, you know, an orientation of humility, curiosity, uh, and interest in, in bringing someone in to help make that happen. You know, um, over my career, I've got, gotten to know a lot of people like that. Mm-hmm. And because I'm drawn to their story here mm-hmm. in, in this case connecticut in my town where my campus was was a mill town originally stanley tools and all the big companies used to make it very prosperous and then when i started there in the mid 80s it was down on the hill i mean the hills mm-hmm. were worn down and there were a lot of people who said why why can't we just lift up this campus and which had been there for 160 years and plunk it right. down s- somewhere <laughs> more more right. hap- more happy and more right. with more vibes, you know. Yeah. And I said, well, why don't we just start vibing from the inside out? And right. maybe it'll help the town grow. And I was a professor at that point. But I had been in community education work prior to that. In fact, uh, when I graduated from college in 1965, uh, I was became a fellow of the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation in Flint, Michigan. Mm-hmm. Charles Stuart Mott was the uh, one of the co-founders of GM, General Motors, mm-hmm. and was the president of GM just part before. He was in his 90s at that time, but before he came into town, I came into town. And we had about 50 of us who were going, right. who were being supported in our graduate work to become educational leaders of a different kind, the kind mm-hmm. that sees the connection between schools and neighborhoods and community. Right. Social services is a wonderful concept, rich, rich concept. Mm-hmm. But Flint had w- was full employment, you know, AC batteries, Buick, everyone was, including the African American community, were making money and had mm-hmm. homes. And it was devastating to me to see what Michael Moore put out some years later. Yeah, I saw that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I said, that's. In when you mentioned repos and so forth, mm-hmm. that couldn't be the same place. Mm-hmm. And yes, money, the big employers pulled back. That that was what his story was in that movie. You, you know, Roger, the guy who, whoever it was, said right. we don't need to be ma- manufacturing on, on, on the shores now. We can do it anywhere. Uh, but 
it 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 just I saw leadership working. you you're, you're mm-hmm. and I saw it even at, it wasn't all that great. I'm telling you, right. there, were, there were those riots going on in Detroit, and there was a lot of tensions. But we had grassroots leadership. That's what I worked on. We had corporate leaders who still weren't into the you know let's get out of here mood, but they they were invested. Mm-hmm. And uh, social services, I, I interned in several of those. They were, they were making things happen, right? And that, it, and it was so important for me to have had that experience. And I brought that message back into New England, and I we set up a center in my little college in Connecticut to pr- promulgate this notion of mm-hmm. schools and the community working together and so forth. And wherever I could find someone like you did in your studies. Mm-hmm. That's where the idea took hold. It was a right. superintendent or a principal, someone. Right. But where I couldn't find those folks because they were saying, "No, oh, no, schools. You know, we don't want to bring people right. in schools at night. You, you know, mm-hmm. that they didn't work." So my whole career, I've been very much attracted to very much to the folks that you want to be helping going forward. Mm-hmm. I'm passing you the baton because right. I, I can't do that here anymore. But it's definitely worth it and when you you will find those or they'll find you Mm -hmm. and they will recognize that they don't want to be associated with decline right with with the stories of saying well one day we used to but now we can't we don't right and uh to me if i were a leader i would try to convince people otherwise but if i couldn't i wouldn't want to keep my spirit in that kind of setting very long mm-hmm. i i would have to replant it someplace where there's hope and optimism right so, this isn't the david Fearon story here <laughs> kelly i'm sorry i got to come back no, to you the last few minutes yeah. because what's your reaction to my my verbal my verbalizing what i believe is so important for your future yeah yeah you know i think um you know, I don't need to tell you this, but as humans, we all want to be helpful, right? And we want sure. to do good in the world. Um, and uh, I think about what President Rogers at VGSU said at our hooding ceremony. He said, uh, uh, be curious and do good in the world. Um, so I think, um, you know, I like I said before, you know, I, I pursued this doctoral program and the research because I figured there's probably people out there that are leading um, the way I was leading, you know, the past 20 years of my life. Uh, You know, if there's a little bit of knowledge that I can gather uh, and share and be helpful to these leaders so that they can do what they want to do, which is be helpful um, and do good in the world, uh, you know, that feels that feels good to me at this stage in my my uh, my life, and I think you know back to the curious um, orientation that President Rogers talked about. Um, I, I do think that those folks are out there. You they know, those are folks who there. are curious and they who are, out are in leadership and who who not only want to do good, they want to learn, and frankly, they want to enjoy what they're doing. Leadership can be so stressful. It can be enormously stressful. And it the paycheck, you know, the paycheck is irrelevant sometimes. They could be paid twice as much as they were just, right. just to keep them. And and I've seen them say, No, sorry. I'd rather dampen down my 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 cost structure and find myself a life because this is this is draining me so those are the folks that you almost you can't help yeah but there are those those who understood that it's not that far down before that could happen to them who will say hey i need a coach i need to be in and some help here because i don't want to see that happen to myself or the folks that i care about in this company or in this agency yeah yeah so i think you know that's my hope is that uh that i can help um help uh, leaders, you know, in in some small way uh, to help them, you know, pursue their goals to do good in the world and to help them enjoy what it is they're doing by helping to alleviate some of the stresses um, and, you know, to help them stay curious and, and help them continue to learn and in turn, you know, help teams and organizations. Well, I've really, Kelly, I, w- I really wish Peter were here and 
I think sometimes I think I'm hearing him speak through my earphones here because that's exactly to whom we addressed the book, to whom we both addressed our careers. Mm -hmm. People who will do something that barely no one else has thought of doing and mainly because they want to learn something from it mm -hmm. and they want to learn something about themselves doing it. Mm -hmm. That's why we call it a way of being. They, mm -hmm. they say, look, I can develop myself countless ways. Life has given me that much freedom of range, woman, man, you name it. Right. Uh, but I want to lock, lock myself onto a, a role where there's going to be a lot of surprises. <laughs> there you go. There's all your agencies and businesses. And I want to be with people who want to discover the solutions to those, uh, handle them positively and turn them into advantage. Mm -hmm. uh, that's who you asked me at the beginning of the call, uh, who, who finds your website and right. listens to these podcasts. And I can say with confidence, without even having data, that's who would listen. Mm -hmm. People like that. Yeah. People who are, well, they want to hear someone else's leadership story because they're having one too. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, some people are passionate studying every bit of a sport, you know, getting the statistics on every player and all that. They've never been on a basketball court, but that's that's their team. Well, I think the same is true of people who admire exemplary leaders mm -hmm. who are aspiring to be that. And it would love to have the people following them nominate them for a, right. a study like this. They're going to listen. Mm -hmm. And and the, we who produce the books and articles and the research, uh, what we want is you folks to read our stuff, mm -hmm. to come and experience our training. We, we want that. We don't just write that stuff to be on right. a shelf. That's right. why I like a digital book. That book can be picked up. Anywhere on a phone, on a, in, you name it, and and read, and I want that to go to anywhere where people are curious about themselves and how they can make themselves a, a better life through through a practice. So yeah, we we're uh, we're we're right on target with this conversation, and I must say, unfortunately, we have to spare our leaders a long conversation this time. But I want to I want to come back in a few years, or no, even less, Kelly, and see how you're doing. This is a great okay. moment in your life. Your, congratulations again. You're now a doctor. And uh, we'll see where you are in a few years. Maybe you'll even go back up to Flint and help them because I think they're still struggling. But. Well, thank you. It's been a real pleasure to spend time with you. And I'm definitely going to pick up the book, Practice as a Way of Being. Good. Or actually, I guess not pick it up. I read no. it online. Well, actually, wherever you're holding something that has a screen there it is and that's right. the, so uh well thank you, you again mm -hmm. great great job thank you thank you for listening to the practice podcast conversations probing the nature of practice if you'd like to hear more go to automatic spotify apple podcast or youtube and please consider purchasing our book on practice as a way of being at mylibrary.world. It's a digital book with lots of features that you do not see in a conventional book. So once again, thank you, and I look forward to you listening again. <laughs>